Hi, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Christy Pooler, and I'm the Product Marketing Director at GE Vernova. Thank you again and welcome aboard to our webinar, which is how more accurate emissions data is crucial to propel the energy transition. Today's speakers include myself. I will be um, leading our, our panel discussion. We also have Cole Fisher, who is the America's Decarbonization Director at GE Vernova. Jeff West, who is the Senior Director of Environmental Services at Excel Energy. And we have Rob Edwards, who is the Managing Director at Hamilton, Ham Hamilton Clark Sustainable Capital and the Vice Chairman Board of Directors for Maryland Clean Energy Center. Today, we're gonna to discuss the following. Um, we'll have Cole who will kick us off and how you can help transform your sustainability programs with more accurate emissions data and more complete data. Um, we have Jeff with Excel um, that's gonna talk about the need for data precision and insight to identify your uh, decarbonization opportunities faster. And then we have Rob with Hamilton Clark Sustainable Capital that's gonna focus on financing the decarbonization of hard to abate industries using validated abatement strategies. And then we'll go into a panel Q&A. So this is gonna be a very conversational um, session uh, with some questions back and forth throughout the, with, throughout the webinar. Um, but what I do ask is uh, just a few housekeeping reminders um, that everyone is gonna be on mute automatically. And if you have a question to go ahead and submit through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom um, interface. And with that, I'm gonna kick this over to Cole Fisher uh, to start the program. Thank you, Christy. And thank you Reuters Events for hosting us today. Thank you, Rob, for joining us. And thank you, Jeff, as well. Looking forward to a discussion today that brings together stakeholders from uh, the financing side of the energy transition, uh, the grid and utility side of the energy transition and the software and industrial side here at GE Vernova. And to kick this off, the reason we're all here is to figure out how emissions data can propel us into a more sustainable future. You know, on this slide in particular, we see industry disruptions, but also opportunities. Opportunities to grow the global energy demand, shift to sustainable and clean energy in a pragmatic manner while we also hit our business targets and our power targets as companies, evolve, evolve and respond to regulatory changes and requirements across the world, and then finance those innovations in a prescriptive way that allows us to hit the energy transition in a meaningful manner. Next slide, Christy. And so while we have disruptions and opportunities, we can now look at why having better emissions data can deliver value. For ourselves at GE Vernova and for our clients, we all have similar challenges as, as highlighted on the previous slide. So more accurate and complete emissions can help drive operational efficiency as an institution. We know where to invest, how to invest, and how to drive the energy transition, but that all hinges on accurate data. It helps us with compliance, interactions with the regulators, interactions with internal and external stakeholders, and then allows us to improve better investment decisions. And that data-driven stakeholder engagement is critical to all of the above. And finally, with better data, we know where and how to be prescriptive to have a competitive advantage as a financing institution, as an industrial and software institution to show those insights, and as a utility to drive energy and, and give the, your power demands to your end clients. So back over to you, Christy. Christy, you're on mute. Sorry about that. There's a little bit of a latency on my side. Um, so how does GE Vernova approach the emission software and how is it different? Um, and give us a little introduction into Sirius and what are some of the differentiators of, um, it compared to traditional, traditional methods? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, so would you mind going on mute? Or are other people getting that feedback? Gotcha. Okay, no. so first and foremost, you know, how does GE Vernova approach um, emission software differently than traditional methods? Um, GE Vernova developed Sirius due to those disruptions and opportunities in emissions management that we highlighted earlier. And we got to work on our end. As a large industrial company, 
we deployed Sirius in its infancy on our gas turbine facilities in Greenville, South Carolina. And GE Vernova's approach through Sirius um, is really built on four modules, uh, collecting accurate data, monitoring accurate data, reporting, and strategizing emissions data. This means the Sirius consolidates data from all assets and sites in the one platform, from the table stakes of carbon accounting and reporting to complex data collection, using our experience to validate data and taking that into CapEx and OpEx into your decarbonization strategy, ensuring efficiency and accuracy and timeliness in collecting data at the operational level to have a prescriptive and robust corporate, corporate strategy and planning in one source of truth. Sirius, by leveraging GE's years of expertise in industrial, IoT, energy, and power software, with the capabilities of ma machine learning and digital twins, eliminates the black box scenarios that a lot of us feel with emissions in general, reduces manual time and spend, serves, as I said, that one source of truth for collection and validation. And on the other side of Sirius, it supports all silos of an organization from plant managers, sustainability officers, financial planning, and executives, so you can hit your demands in your emissions in a critical way in one, one software. Thank you. So how about, here's another question for you. Can you provide an example of a successful transformation in a net zero program using our software? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're gonna hear um, later on today from, uh, we're lucky to have Excel Energy on the call, the first utility to ever hit a net zero target. And um, you know, they are a leader in deploying technology and, and have a good use case of, of our software and how they've applied it. But um, other adopters of Sirius have highlighted the main benefits of streamlining complex data and validation on one end and using that good data and accurate data to be prescriptive in their abatement strategies, marginal abatement curves at the other end is the solution driver. Um, carbon accounting and reporting modules are, are table stakes. And the successful transformation of clients via Sirius flows further into taking that data, supporting CapEx, OpEx, integrated resource planning, for example, giving clients the ability to run scenarios across operating companies, across assets, projects, and beyond, zeroing in on the most effective way to abate and invest prescriptively. But on the other side of that, having the most accurate and validated data to make those decisions. So assisting with project timelines is a successful transformation that we've seen um, across across pilots and the likes for executive decision making, uh, decision making, providing streamlined view of projects, showing if they're tracking or not tracking to net, net zero, how to hit those and address those, and allowing our clients to hit business goal, goals most importantly, hit their power demands, hit their business goals, all while moving in lockstep with an emission strategy that makes sense, prescriptive to your business. Thank you. Now, we all know that the um, energy organizations and heavy industrials comes with specific challenges to the organization to improve their emissions data. Um, what, what are some of those challenges and how can we abate those challenges? Yeah, um, you know, and, and a lot of these challenges, quite frankly, we feel at, at GE Vernova as well. So self-serving in the sense that, you know, we get to build a software that gets to solve these solutions, but it really starts with collecting and validating complex data. Make sure that data is accurate. Um, large organizations in hard to abate uh, sectors, they have data and emissions data across scope one, two, and three that exist in different sources, can be bifurcated, and validating that data is critical. Um, you know, secondly, organizations face challenges is the need for robust data collection, for stakeholder engagement, regular regulatory and investor scrutiny. So making sure that that data is extremely accurate is, a, is, is probably where we see um, the challenges in, or, in the main organizational um, dislocation to actual decision-making. They also need to ensure the accuracy and validation of data across all sites to integrate this into a single platform so they have a holistic view. So this complex problem that software can make faster and more accurate across scope emissions, across jurisdictions, across asset types, across calculation nuances, there's a lot of complexities with emissions data and that all hinges on you know, that, that accuracy um, and that validation. Okay, we have one last question for you. So how does GE Vernova connect the importance of scope emissions to decarbonization in delivering electricity as well as financial efforts in the hard to abate sectors? 
Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's it's a great question. Uh, us here at GE Vernova, um, you know, our, our motto is electrify and decarbonize the world. So with that in mind, GE Vernova's platform supports the entire ecosystem of emissions for those sectors and those hard to abate sectors, right? Hitting your business demands or your electrification demands while also decarbonizing in a manner that is prescriptive. So providing elect executive level oversight to track and meet emissions targets and hit those CapEx, um, bringing it all together from data to financing and data to investment. Um, Sirius also allows a, an improvement of enter enterprise data flow to support things like ESG scores, scope emissions for financial reporting for the SEC and the like and other jurisdictions that are calling to see what these scope emissions are for your, for your business's profile. Also allows you to get more prescriptive into project-based financing. If you know where emissions are a problem within your operating companies, you know how to invest in those, in those areas. Leads to better uh, linked sustainable financing efforts, which Rob is going to talk to later on today and how data affects that. Um, so all in all, offering abatement planning to support client net zero projects in a fiscally sound manner. Having a clear view of this data supports hit, hitting business goals, investing to hit power demands, hitting those net zero goals, while moving in lockstep with your emissions targets. No, that's great. I think the folks have heard from us. So we're going to transition over to um, Excel and Cole and, and Jeff. It's it's all you. Awesome. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Jeff, you are on mute, my friend. I took it off. It should have been. Anyway, it, anyway, um, go ahead and introduce myself very quickly here. Jeff West, Senior Director of Environmental Services for Excel Energy, as Cole mentioned earlier. Excel Energy is a uh, regulated utility basically running across the central United States. We operate in eight different states. We uh, run operations in the form of generation, uh, in the form of fossil fuels, renewable energy and wind and solar and battery, uh, refuse derived fuel, uh, in addition, we have two nuclear facilities in our northern states operations. We also uh, run transmission and distribution of electric and gas throughout those states as well. And then where I'll tout, where I'm pretty proud of where I work at right now, Cole mentioned it earlier, we were the first utility around 2015 that actually had a carbon-based initiative, 80% from 2005 levels reduction by 2030 and 100% carbon-free by 2050. Since then, we've also aligned in 2021 our gas system to meet those similar goals as a 100% carbon reduction or carbon elimination by 2050. Uh, seeing several other, many other utilities follow in line with that and uh, consider ourselves a leader in the industry when it comes to carbon reporting. And so happy to be here today and talk about some of the things that we have and emissions and the importance of that data and the strategy and challenges and align that with Rob and his aspect from the financing side. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate you hitting early on on Excel sustainability goals. Um, curious, you know, how do you use emissions management tools, software, um, and, and how do these help you in your role at Excel? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, we live in a world with a lot of data. Data is knowledge and knowledge becomes power. And that's how you can make decisions on where you need to go and where you're going to be. I mentioned earlier, we had a net zero vision of 80 by, we call it 80 by 30 and 100 by 50. It's a bold statement to make, but it's a pretty easy statement to make. But after that, now you got to actually do it and make sure it happens. And having the ability to have that data, to have it accurate, to have it in a manner that is easily, easily maneuvered around your organization to make those decisions moving forward so you can strategy and plan for those applications to meet those targets. Be honest with you, the 20 by 30 goal being 80% reduced, that's a fairly easy goal. Going 100% by 2050, gonna need some help, gonna need some technology enhancements, gonna need some other things that are gonna happen in that area with that. And having the emissions data accurate in a central repository, a central location, easily maneuvered to make decisions for the future is paramount in achieving those goals. Thank you. and. Uh... You know, want to call out Excel Energy for being uh, such a leader in this side of the industry. Um, you know, investing now so you don't have to invest later it really seems to be a message that uh, Excel uh, thinks about all the time in, in the work we've done together. So, with that in mind, you know, we'd love 
you to walk us through your relationship with emissions data, how it affects your day to day. And um, as senior director of environmental services at Excel, what keeps you up at night? How do you move forward? And uh, yeah, just want to, you know, your day to day with this data. I'd love to hear more. Yeah, data comes in a variety of different different mechanisms that are out there. Um, we have, as you, as we've mentioned, a variety of different emission sources. And as we align those in the carbon spectrum from scope one to scope two to scope three, we've got to have a good way to assimilate and bring that forward to see where we're standing today, where we want to be in the future, what maneuvers or changes we need to make within that system, and how can we partner all of that to, quote unquote, clean up the grid electrification downstream with vehicles and other industries and actions that we can really work through to make that work through that. So it's it's a constant maneuver through the actions of seeing the data, seeing where we're at, making these decisions, because some decision points require more time than other decision points to move forward. There's a capital investment aspect associated with that. There's the regulatory mechanism that's associated with it, with us being a regulated utility. Many decisions that we make in that space cannot occur just because we want it to. We have to go through a process to get approval of that, to have that happen and to make that, that process work for us. And then what keeps me up at night the most about that is our emissions data and predominantly our carbon emissions data, because that's where a lot of scrutiny is now, is the most scrutinized data that we send out there. And we have to make sure that it's accurate and we have to make sure that it's correct. And it's in the right reporting mechanisms that align with our vision in a company, because if we don't, the worst thing you can do to a company, and I'm sure Rob will agree with this, is reputational harm. It's so easy to get rid of it, and it's so hard to get back when that happens. So you got to be accurate, you got to be right, and you got to be telling the right story, and your story's got to align with your actual actions that you're doing. And that's the importance of having very quick, accurate, and credible data. Once you have that accurate data um, and it's quick and it's accessible, I mean, obviously the goal to decarbonize the grid at Excel Energy, you know, what's the next step? You know, how do you use that data once it's accurate and, and applied? We'll look at as far as there's, there's two different spectrums that we have. One is internally within Excel Energy and meeting our goals. And that is the strategy component of planning out how we're retiring other generation, what we're bringing in for new generation, what forms of that generation is based upon the technologies that are available now. We're seeing technologies just increase exponentially. Think about where batteries were 10 years ago and where they are today. Wind farms and wind turbines and solar panels and those things and how we maneuver that and how we can do that in a sense that is reliable, but yet affordable to our customers and our stakeholders. But the other side of that is working with our states and our regulatory bodies and agencies on working through how can our efforts promulgate into other industry and other areas that we can electrify them. Like you said, decarbonize and electrify the world. We can do one thing on our side, but on the other side, there are other industries that are very difficult to abate because of where they're at and the things that are occurring. How can we continue to strive and drive into those industries to electrify that, to further decarbonize that market, making it reliable, cost affordable, and accurate? So those are a lot of the simulations that we have every day with data and how that's used and how that's moved forward. It's a great answer. And you know, taking that a step further, Excel has been extremely progressive in, in, in movements on this front. You know, why should other utilities adopt this practice? Why should other downstream um, consumers of energy adopt this practice? You've hit on you know, your use case at Excel, but also that use case downstream as well. Just what, what benefits have you seen from, from really being progressive in this area? Yeah, th th that's a great question. And it's, it's a great application that we get when you look at other utilities when maybe they're extending coal facilities or extending fossil fuel units. We've been very staunch and straight with our targets and where we're at and how we're going to get there. And I think it's important to be that way because we know decarbonation is going to happen. It's just a matter of when and where it will because it needs to happen. And it can be pushed from a regulatory space, whether it be through our uh, agencies, through the Department of Energy or the Environmental Protection Agency or anything else. But the other side of that is basically three factors that we bring into that are another driver other than we believe it's the right thing to do. And that is our shareholders and our investors want us to move in that direction. Our customers and our stakeholders, as far as our regulatory bodies, want us to move in that direction. 
And lastly, our banks and our financiers, because we have to get capital to secure these type of actions. And that's how you become a solvent company. They want us to move in that direction as well. So when you put those three together, you know, even though we think it's the right thing to do, you don't really have a choice in that specter too. So you might as well do it now and work towards to get that so you can get ahead of the curve as opposed to being behind that curve. Those are, those are great insights. And um, yeah, I would love to dive deeper into Excel's applied uh, emissions financing, but maybe that's a topic for Rob here shortly, but you hit on something in that answer, regulation. Um, you know, in, in your eyes, is there a, a need for universal reference for emissions data, universal calculations by sector um, supported by the regulator? Um, things seem to be bifurcated. Uh, in your seat, you know, how, how do you address this and, and where do you see things going? That's a great question. And I saw a question in the chat that I think will address this as well. Um, yes, I think that right now, I don't call it the wild, wild west, but there are a variety of different ways that you can report your carbon data. The really only driver out there right now is the EPA mandatory reporting rule that we report every spring, but it doesn't really get to the level of carbon reporting that we really need to have out there. Excel Energy was a founding member of the Climate Registry in 2005. The Climate Registry, or TCR, are a series of protocols that are used for carbon reporting that we have been very instrumental in with other utilities in that to define how we should report carbon. And what that allows us is an opportunity to actually have a third-party certification of our carbon reporting to say, yes, they follow these protocols, these emissions are accurate, and this is where they should be. We have 17 years of that that we have straight with that on moving through that. I think as we go forward, there is going to have to be a uniform standardization of how we report these scope emissions and this data. Because if not, the information that it provides can lead you down different paths that might not be accurate with that. We've already seen states start to do that. As a matter of fact, we're working with the state of Colorado right now on how we report data how we report our carbon, how we catch these emissions, how we use offsets of sales and other things in there to align with how the state of Colorado would like to do that. And we're going to see more appetite as we move that forward. But as we continue to look to decarbonize the world in that scenario, everybody needs to be on that level playing field of how they're reporting the data and what the data means. And right now we don't have that. And so I think it'll be important that we have that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um... And, it, and to bring this back internal at Excel, right? We've got external financing and, and regulation, but bringing it back internal, emissions is a complex topic at every organization. It, it, it lives with the chief sustainability officer, it lives with environmental, it lives in finance, it lives in operations. Data at Excel straddle those, um, how it overlaps with financing, how it overlaps with operational insights, how it, oper it overlaps with executives and um, decision-making. So uh, it's, it's my last question to you, but um, if you could talk to the nuance of emissions straddling an entire organization, that would be, that'd be great. Yeah, um, and like I said, we, we live in a world where data is, is power and it comes very fast and it comes very quick and it comes from a lot of different sources. And that data is the fundamental basis for any point of decision-making that you're going to do. What investments are you gonna make in the future? to make that, to meet your car, targets with that. How are you going to do that? Are you achieving your goals? So from your financing standpoint and your credibility, you are actually achieving what needs to be done. And so you can secure that type of money. From an executive standpoint, they are continuing to tout Excel Energy as, as a carbon leader, as our ejection are achieving, looking for investors, looking for profitability in our company and those type of actions. It's important to have that right data as well. So that stretches across all of that, uh, those venues and the quickness of having that data is, is pretty care paramount there because there are some times where things and opportunities can come up and you need to make a decision pretty quick on what's going to happen in that. And to have that correct data and to have it in a spot and a location that is easily accessible and readable allows you to make better informed decision making and can move faster as an organization. We're a hundred year old regulated utility. I call this a herd of turtles sometimes. And so we have to really move faster than that at times. And th that allows us to do it. Well, uh, thank you for your, your answers, Jeff. And thank you to Excel Energy for being uh, the fastest of the herd of turtles by a mile, I think, uh, in terms of net zero commitments and decarbonization. So uh, looking forward to continuing our work together and 
uh, more questions to come in the panel here, but over to our next speaker, a man who uh, leads, needs little introduction, Rob Edwards. Um, looking forward to speaking with you here, but over to you, Rob, and um, we'll let you introduce yourself here. Thanks, Cole, and thanks, Christy and Jeff. This has already been illuminating for me, and I've we've already been practicing this together. So, um, Rob Edwards here. I'm a managing director at Hamilton Clark Sustainable Capital, Inc. We are a boutique investment bank with a 30-year history, and we put the word sustainable into our title before it was fashionable. So what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I raise debt and equity capital, advise clients seeking BIL and IRA funds through DOE cost share grants, DOE loan program office loans, and companies who are looking to attract and monetize uh, energy tax credits, be they 48C, 45X, 40, et cetera, the alphabet soup of energy tax credits. All of our clients are energy transition clients. And every one of our, um, and everyone working for our clients really has a sustainability in their job function. My clients span a wide range of sectors, including green cement, low carbon aluminum, municipal solid waste to bio-based materials to substitute for polyethylene and plastics that come from petroleum, um, and other clients who are working uh, through a variety of ways, but with one common theme. Every client has got to do a reduction of greenhouse gases as compared to the base case scenario. Each of our clients have their own proprietary technologies, which materially reduce scope one and scope two emissions as compared to business as usual. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for the intro, Rob. And um, really exciting to see everything that Hamilton and Clark is doing on this front. Stemming from Jeff's conversation now onto the financing side of things, how does emissions data influence your job and your end clients' strategies as they go out and think about um, financing their sustainable efforts? Well, um, it really is nice to follow Jeff and his discussion, which he alluded to, which in includes not just cleaning up the grid, but enabling the utilities customers to clean up their own production processes. So um, for companies, and we're back to data, companies can only manage that which they can measure. For innovative companies like green cement and bio-based materials, financiers expect for those companies to have various LCA analyses done by reputable third parties, which validate the scope of emissions reduction. So think about this. If you are starting a new emerging energy transition company, and you are bringing either a brand new product to market or you're bringing uh, production of a new, uh, you, you're building batteries, long duration energy storage batteries. In these cases, especially in things like green cement and, and low carbon aluminum, you need to really have an, an analysis upfront before you build your manufacturing plant to predict what the reduction of greenhouse gases will obtain after the plant is built. And to do that, you start out with an LCA analysis done by reputable, reputable entities. But then as you build your plant, you're eventually going to be in the business of measuring the exact scope one and scope emissions from your brand new manufacturing plant. So this goes right back to everything Paul and Jeff were saying. All of these companies trying to raise money as energy transition companies, whether you're dealing with the DOE, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, or investors like TPG and others, one of their first analyses they do is relating to what is your impact on greenhouse gas emission reductions? If you can't demonstrate that clearly to the financiers, you know, they may send you to another part of their organization, but you're not going to be financed as part of either the green group or energy transition uh, financing group. And and, and I think also, um, you know, the, the, there is a divide between mature industries that are trying to abate uh, emissions and new companies trying to bring to market new products and services that abate emissions. So let me just walk through a little bit. It's not quite a full-blown taxonomy, but here, here's, here's some ideas. So um, for more mature industries like steel and aluminum, 
companies are innovating around two vectors to lower their emissions. Lowering scope one emissions through, for example, electrifying production processes, which formula related relied on fossil fuels. So that's what we say when we talk about electrifying everything. If I have an aluminum plant or a steel plant, my goal is to look into my scope one emissions and see if I can take out gas fired heating systems and put in electric heating systems. That, and then of course, we got to look back to Jeff and say, is my, are my electrons green, right? So I need Jeff to give me renewable energy, energy storage and the like, and then I can take out the natural gas fired boiler and put in something that is driven by electricity. Um, and in the coming years, I mean, I think um, they also, of course, everyone wants to lower scope to emissions. But I think the big elephant in the room on that is AI data centers, right? And we've all been reading about this every day. Microsoft teams up with company A, Google with company B, and, you know, Am and um, Amazon with company C. And all of a sudden, the folks in Silicon Valley have found nuclear energy, right? They didn't, they didn't know those words 20 years ago. They could care less about nuclear energy. But now everyone has seen that the ability to bring renewables, which are intimate resources, to these giant AI data centers is a mismatch, right? We don't have enough renewables, and we can't make them firm enough to really power AI data centers. So this is going to result in the rebirth of nuclear. I think I touched on things I wanted to talk touch on there, Cole. Yeah, the data centers is an interesting one that we'll come back to later in, in some panel questions. But, um, you know, bringing this back to your your role, um, Rob, you've, you're an, uh, a DOA attorney appointed under Obama. You're in the Maryland, you're the vice chairman of Maryland Clean Energy, uh, an investment banker. Um, you know, can you can you discuss the role of public and private sectors in financing the energy transition, how data you know, comes into play in that? And um, I guess what, what you see in your seat of um, technology, software, data, influencing this downstream, both in the public and private um, influences. Yeah, so I'm gonna first start with a small history lesson because I think people should remember this history. The BIL and IRA are the children of the ARA, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. That was passed, it was one of the first pieces of legislation passed under President Obama in 2009. And at that time, it represented the largest investment in clean energy in the history of the world, right? Um, and, and, and we took, we had more funding under IRA than the entire budget of the Department of Energy. So in two years time, we grew that, we grew that Department of Energy and built the muscle and capabilities to take you know, several hundred million dollars into the economy over a two year period. So now we fast forward and we, we, we come to the BIL and the IRA, those uh, we had built basically an infrastructure at DOE through Recovery Act. And then we are expanding it by 10X for IRA and BIL. One thing that John Podesta always loves to say, he said this to me, he said, you know, Rob, the difference between the Recovery Act and IRA is a trillion dollars. And he's not kidding. It is a trillion dollars. So, so how do we tie together both the private sector driving the energy transition and the government sector helping to drive it? The, the, the words that you know President Biden and everybody likes to use is government-enabled, private sector-led. Because even a trillion dollars of government spending is not enough to get us to where we need to do to avoid that increase, 1.5 degrees centigrade increase in temperatures. So nearly all of the IRA programs require applicants to demonstrate in their concept papers and then in full applications that the proposed project will materially reduce greenhouse gas emissions as compared to the base case. So you're not gonna get any money out of BIL, well, IRA, unless you can prove that in the first instance. So for example, under Title 17 of the DOE Loan Programs Office, which I have a lot of experience with, the part one analysis for Title 17 requires the applicant to reach over two hurdles, two requirements. One, the, the, the technology is innovative, right? And that means it has not been done more than three times in the last five years in the United States. And then secondly, 
you've got to demonstrate that your project will materially reduce greenhouse gases as compared to business as usual, right? So for example, let's let's take a, a case of, of modular housing, for example. How can modular housing be an energy transition company? Well, you know what? It creates housing, which is more sustainable by design in its construction, requires less energy for heating and cooling over the life of the home as compared to traditional homes built at the construction site. So why is this accepted into the Title 17 program? Because my house uses a lot more energy than a modular home that's built in the factory. And then secondly, every one of us who've ever been to a new home construction site, so much stuff is thrown away because you bring out large amounts of stuff and then you cut it to, cut it to size at the construction site and you just throw the rest away. Um, and, and so that is the, the theme here. And it relates to what I said earlier. Remember I said, if you're going into the Goldman Sachs Energy Group or the JP Morgan Green Economy Group, you better have a story about greenhouse gas reduction and you better have the data to back it up because otherwise they're not interested. Similarly, if you don't have the data, whether it's an LCA analysis or other things, you're not gonna be categorized as an energy transition company, and you'll be sent to some other part of the bank to get funded. So, you know, and again, just to put a fine bow on top of this, none of this gets done without verified emissions data. None of this. Because we're in business to reduce greenhouse gases to save the planet. That's why we exist. And if you don't have the data that says you're going to do that, then you're not doing what you need to do. I'm getting a little fired up here, so I apologize for the level of enthusiasm. I, I love it, Rob, and, and thank you for a robust answer and insights into to things both public and private in nature. You sit in a very interesting seat being able to see this um, across multiple industries. Bringing this back into sort of the harder to abate, older established uh, industries like utilities, oil and gas, mid up downstream, but mostly oil, oil and gas in general, and then Utilities in general, are there any themes that you're, that you're seeing? And this will be our, our final question until we go to the, P, uh, to the uh, panel. You know, challenges you're seeing in those, in those industries and how data can help them um, and, and cha challenges particularly to financing. Uh, just can, can, I, that, can I start that, with that? that? Together. Yeah. Can I start, Cole? All right, here we go again. Another history lesson, right? <laughs> you go back to the turn of the century. Beforehand, all of the utilities were vertically integrated from generation, transmission, distribution to the home, right? That worked well for quite a long time, but there was one inherent problem with that. Since it was vertically integrated, no one really was measuring or quite understood where value could be created in each of the elements of the electric sector. And because you didn't have to, you just used transfer pricing and all you did was make sure you had profits at the end of the day. But once you separate it out, generation, transmission, distribution, and then business people had PL responsibility to manage their, their particular sector, that's when you started to understand better where opportunities for efficiency existed within the electric sector. That's globally. Now I'm got one last point. Then we add technology, digitization, smart grids. We put $5 billion worth of smart meters into the economy in 2009 through 2014. That formed the basis for the digitization of Edison's analog grid. And this is now the, the, the foundation that we're building on, right? So when we talk about energy storage, that is a demand side asset located at the load, right? And we've never had this before. We never had an asset that can take electrons and store them and then release them at the right time. Because it used to be under Edison's analog grid. Remember when they turned on the lights at the football field and everybody was happy 100 years ago? You had to use the electricity when it was produced. You had no choices. Now with energy storage, you can time shift the use of electrons. But the challenge is, of course, is that the economics of energy storage are not yet there because the prices of batteries and systems are still too high vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what they are trying to do. 
So we are now at the most exciting time in the history of the electric sector. And you know what? For the first time, Thomas Edison wouldn't, re re wouldn't recognize the equipment. You know, tw 20 years ago, Thomas Edison could come back with his friends and say, there's a generating a session. There's a generating station. The electrons come over the wires and it lights a home. Now we've got a dynamic system which can move electrons in two directions and creates loads of opportunities. Let me stop there because I'm, 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 I'm droning on to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And thank you for your insights. Um, very valuable as we navigate the energy transition. Um, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Christy. Now, now is a good time to segue into panel Q&A. And so over to you, Christy. Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Rob. It was um, a very exciting history lesson. And I, I appreciate a lot of that and your expertise. And Jeff, of course, um, for bringing you know, the practicality of, of Excel energy and moving forward of sustainability. Um, so we have a few questions for, for the panel. And then I'll uh, get to some of the Q&A as well uh, from the audience. So this question is for Jeff. What are the most common misconceptions about emissions data and sustainability programs? Um, I think one of them we've already addressed, and that is there's a uniform way to report it, state your goals, state those activities. That there's not. Um, you know, at the end of it, the, the fundamental baseline is a simple algorithmic equation of what you're in, what you're out, and what you're left with. But how you report that and how you bring into that is, is another aspect of that. Another common misnomer out there is, and, and this can probably be answered in a couple of the questions that uh, are listed in the Q&A, and that is the speed and action with which it can actually be done, but yet re maintain reliability and affordability. Um, Rob mentioned about battery technologies and how where they're at and the affordability is not there you know, quite yet from that scenario. Um, I'll just be honest. Um, we could, and when I say tomorrow, I'm being very superlative when I say that, we could go carbon free tomorrow if we could. I could put wind turbines, I could put solar panels, I could use battery and I could put SMRs everywhere else. Nobody could afford it. Nobody could afford it. And so there's a balance that you have to bring between that misnomer of bringing reliability and affordability. And so having that data is paramount to what goals are you making and having a plan and sticking to that plan to get there? Great, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna pop in one of the questions. I think you mentioned that in your, um, in your, your readout. Um, so from a misconception of emissions data, tying that back into standardization for, was there a body within Excel Energy focused on um, standardization of requirements for the data? Yeah, we, um, like I said earlier, we are, we're one of the founding members of the Climate Registry, TCR, which we mainly will run our standardization and our protocols through that. That is how we report our carbon okay. data. Published, you can see it. That's how we move that. Um, there are manifestations that occur as data becomes more and more deeper and more and more actions and technologies change. And what we do in that scenario is develop what we think is the appropriate reporting mechanism for that. Then we'll go to C TCR and say, can we generate a protocol? Does this make sense to you? Is this something we can do? Generate that protocol. And then we are judged against that protocol as well. So that, that, that's our balancing body that we have with Excel Energy. So it's not just Excel Energy saying this. It's Excel mm -hmm. Energy with another source that is certifying that this is accurate data. Great. Thank you. All right, Cole, this one is for you. How can companies balance the need for speed with the need for more accurate data within their sustainability efforts? Yeah, thank you, Christine. It's a, it's a great question and I'll, I'll answer this pretty briefly. It's, it's two areas in my mind. It's, it's partnering with the right partners and having the right tools. Um, the clients we work with at GE Vernova who are looking to decarbonize will also hit their business demands they have to have tools to, to accurately collect in a timely manner bifurcated and complex data. And then leveraging a partner like G Vernova, who has 
you know, years and years of IoT industry, energy and power software experience to collect and aggregate and automate that data for them that's validated. So if you want to be accurate and you want to be fast and you, you partner with, with people who know the industry and live in that industry, um, have those partners and build those tools together. Great, thank you. All right, Rob, this one's for you as well. So what role does innovation play in the energy transition? And how do you see emissions management software supporting this transformation alongside other technologies? All right, so um, innovation is at the heart of everything. It's at the heart of America. It's at the heart of everything we do every day. So let's think about it this way, more history lessons, right? When I decided to focus on clean energy in the United States, it was 2000. Solar panels, prices were ridiculously through the roof. Nobody had wind, nobody had nothing, right? So 20, 30 years later, we now have solar and wind at cost parity with coal, if not lower. So we had innovation 20 years ago, which allowed us to get to where we are today. So when I think about the energy transition now, it's two things. Scale what we already know that works, which means more solar, more wind, microgrids. Improve the efficiency and cost points of things that are in their earlier stages. That's long duration energy storage and some other technologies. And then continue to innovate brand new stuff. The brand new stuff is not going to bend the emissions curves and for another decade. But we've got to scale what we've got that we know that works and then bring in the brand new stuff and know that we can rely on that a decade from now. Now, emissions software. Okay. So before the Paris Protocol, really, right, nobody was really measuring emissions. Jeff mentioned the EPA was trying to do what it could do and, you know, cut down smut from coal-fired power plants, measure emissions, blah, blah, blah. But it was never a business imperative, right? Emissions were not the same as your EBITDA, gross margins, profits, cash, cash to shareholders. Now emissions is not quite yet there, but it's taking its place alongside these other metrics of financial performance. That is new. And people like to criticize ESG. I would, I would ask those people to go back and look at GAP in 1935 and, and ask if GAP was perfect then. So now for the first time, Christy, everybody's got to measure their emissions. Everyone. <laughs> Whether I've got an ice cream stand on the corner or I'm building a data set. And if everyone is like doing that with a pencil and paper and then they send it to somebody, we'll never get there. So we have to have automated emissions data. We've got to learn how to calculate big data and then we have to apply AI to it so that we can be predictive and it helps not just tell us you know, what happened in the past, but it can start to inform decisions going forward. So what you guys do at GE, and this is not a plug, I'm not being paid to say this, but what you guys do at GE is at the heart of this all because the tools that you are building they have a home in every company because every company is a sustainability company and every job is a sustainability job. But we can only do what we're supposed to do if we have the right measuring tools and we have the right computing power to guide our decisions. And we can only guide our decisions if we know what has happened in the past. All right, here we go. Thank you. No, that's fantastic. In, in fact, um... You're hired. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so we have a, a, a message or excuse me, a question for Jeff. Don't want to leave you off the hook anymore, Jeff. Um, many companies have set net zero targets. Do you see an inflection point with achievable targets being substantiated mm. by a regulatory body on emissions and auditing emissions data? Yeah, uh, we're already seeing it with states. Uh, we, as a matter of fact, went out there and uh, we made our statement about 80 by 30. We've seen some other states come in with potentially more progressive goals that are happening in there. And so we'll continue to see that move as we go through there. And 
you know, yeah. Is there an inflection point? Well, I mean, the end point's 100% carbon free. Mm -hmm. We all know that we can't get there. It's a matter of getting there affordably and reliably. When we made our statement earlier uh, in 2015, we said, you know, 80 by 30, we have a really strong, solid plan to get there. Um, there's That's kind of the, not really the low hanging fruit, but there's a lot of things that can happen as long as they occur as they're supposed to, to get there. We're, we're exceeding that target. We're on our goal to exceed that target. But we were very bold in that last 20%. And we said for that last 20%, we need several things to happen for us to get there. Number one, our nuclear facilities need to be relicensed and utilized for the future because that is a carbon-free energy source. Technologies have to advance at the level that we've seen them advance in the past. Battery storage has to come to a certain location. Other technology, as far as compressed energy, kinetic storage, you know, those type of things that occur have to wrap right there. And lastly, the regulations and the policies need to align with how fast and what the industry wants to move. That is one of the biggest challenges we see right now is a lot of the regulations don't align with how quick this industry needs to move. And so we've got to make sure those things align back together. So uh, I think that answered the question there in, in, in totality. Yeah, so. I, I think so. Um, but to dovetail off of that question, we had a question come in through the chat for you, Jeff, um, is how and why did you find easy, or say what <laughs> did you find easy, an 80% reduction and what made the hard going after the additional 20% to get to 100%? Yeah, e easy is a is a good word that's there in parentheses. Like I said earlier, you know, yeah. with, with our current plans and retirements and clean energy plans, you know, that, that there's a good goal for that. But I, I think I covered it a little bit earlier, that 20%. It's hard okay. because I'm not, not all of it is in our control. We, you know, we can do our best to shape policy, shape those actions, shape those things. But there are some things that we need to happen and occur that we are involved in in being a point of that. And, and like Rob said, our involvement and our status and our movement towards that direction is imperative to be in a solution like GE Vernova, not on a notepad. And we need to have some standardization of that data so everybody plays on the same level field mm -hmm. when it comes to that. And they're reporting you know, apples to apples, to use the old cliche. Great, thank you. All right, so this is a question for both Rob and Jeff. Um, we keep hearing about data centers. Uh, we know that data centers are very electrical, in electricity intensive, heating, cooling, you name it. Um, how is that problem going to be addressed by both utilities as well as financing efforts? And we'll start with you, uh, Rob. Let's give Jeff a break. You're next, Jeff. Yeah. Rob. Um, well, we are seeing what's happening right now on the ground. I'm involved in a few data centers. Firstly, people cite the current generation data centers in places where they know they will have access to renewable energy. That means, mm -hmm. for example, we have one in Maryland that's trying to go up. And I went out there. It's beautiful farmland. You know, if I lived out there, the last thing I would want is a data center, but that's not me. And I, God, I shouldn't have said that because I represent Governor Moore. But putting that aside, <laughs> they 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 put it at a place where there was an old aluminum smelter. The aluminum smelter, however, was demolished 30 years ago. So what you have is this incredible plot of land with high voltage transmission lines coming into nowhere. So that is the short-term solution. Cite your data center where the energy infrastructure already exists to bring in renewable power. We're going to run out of that pretty quickly because the, the magic uh, companies, you know, the Googles, Amazons, they've got a trillion dollars to invest in this space. And there are only but so many sites that look like that. So the next thing is SMRs. The only challenge with SMRs is that it's going to still take some time. Only two SMR designs have actually been approved by NERC, the Nuclear Energy Regulatory Authority, right? Um, commission. So, you know, it, nobody knows how long it will take for the NERC to certify these new SMR technologies and designs that are coming through the pipeline. Even for those that have already been um, um, certified, it's still going to take time to get units one, two, and three deployed. And nobody's going to make a big bet on an SMR technology that has not been 
proven through operation of the SMR technology, right? So I, I'm glad that Google and these others are going to invest tremendous amounts of money into the SMR ecosystem. But I think it's going to take longer to get the results from those investments and for those SMRs to actually show up co-located at data centers or showing up at a retired coal-fired power plant or, or at a decommissioned nuclear cell. So my, my thing here is we've got some short-term solutions, but the longer, the medium and longer term is still uncertain. Great, thank you, Rob. Jeff, you're up to bat. Yeah, I will partner with that. Um, and you, you hit the nail on the head there, basically intensive. Data centers are three to 500 megawatts or more. And for mm -hmm. folks that are on here that don't understand what that means, that's a power plant. Uh, that's essentially the size of probably a gas-fired power plant that we have out there. So it's an intense amount of energy. Uh, these data centers are, they've got the money and they want it to happen yesterday. Um, and this is the wrench that gets thrown into the plan as you have a good plan on where you're going to go and how you're going to meet there. And now you need to meet these requirements from a standpoint of providing them the energy because that allows your transmission of, of energy your transformation to become more affordable for your clients or your other customers because you've now generated more revenue that's coming to your facility that you can use to offset other costs for others that, that come in with that. And so that balance is um, is 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 an intricate deal. And and Rob, I was very impressed how much you, you referenced exactly kind of where we go with that. Right now, these data centers, we're putting at retired coal plants, we're putting at retired facilities where you've got transmission, you've got interconnection, you've got everything right there. The next round of that is going to be, all right, now, now that we've got to put them out here, I don't have a transmission line out there. I don't have these other things that happen. I need other technologies to make sure that is renewable because they want to be renewable in that space. And this is where I said a lot of the regulations and the bodies are behind and catching up on where we need to go to get there. And so referencing that now and saying, this is something that needs to happen. This is something that needs to change. Let's get the voices happening on this. So when it happens, we're not just sitting there going, what do we do now? Yeah, you know, I, you know, 100%, Jeff. And I would like to plug, put in a plug for Maryland and Governor Westmore. We actually want those data centers out there in the beautiful countryside. We're just going to make it fit in beautifully. But Jeff's right. This the, the One of the biggest hurdles are lagging policy. Policy is lagging technology and is not forward looking enough. Public utility commissions, their job is to keep the lights on and they've done a fabulous job. We have one of the best electric systems in the world, bar none. But now we've got to take that forward and public utility commissions need to be more active and innovative to allow the new technologies to come in new structures and business models to come in and to cut down the time for permitting for everything. You know, it takes too long to permit a high voltage transmission line for a lot of reasons. And here's one more historical note for everyone on, on the phone. Why do, why do we have a natural gas pipeline system that is, again, the largest in the world is because of the natural gas and it federalized the rules applying to the purchase, sale, generation of natural gas. We don't have that in electricity. We've got the FERC that controls the bulk electric power system. And then we've got 51 PUCs and PSCs plus additional local regulations. So no wonder we can't get anything done in electricity because there are so many regulatory bodies that have authority to slow you down. And I don't know, there's no one quick answer on that, but Jeff is 100% right. We need to be answering that question with the urgency of now so that 10 years from now, we actually will see SMRs being cited next to new data centers that need an SMR to be co-located because they can't get renewable energy or carbon-free energy anywhere else. And what I'd add real quick is, I know we're out of yeah. time, but I think it's important is to utilize successful measures we've learned and had in the past to move that forward. Rob mentioned earlier, 20 years ago, wind turbine, solar panels, crazy expensive. Well, the government came out with a PTC and an ITC. 
said, all right, I'm going to make these affordable so I can jumpstart the industry. But they are going to be done over a period of time, which now forces a business if they want to play in that specter to get more innovative, to bring their costs down and to drive that action with that. That's how you jumpstart those and get those things moving. Because at the end of the day, we are a capitalistic society and that's what mm -hmm. we're based on. And so I think those are the important acronyms we have to bring as well into that. Thank you. Yeah, we had we had a very uh, good discussion today and I appreciate all of you guys. And of course, for the, the attendees and folks sticking around, um, we did learn a lot. We know that the demand for energy is increasing. We do know that, you know, decarbonizing at the uh, simultaneously is important. Uh, you have the technologies and tools um, and please let us know and uh, we'll get to some of the questions um, in the Q&A. We'll send those out as well. But thank you all and uh, you guys have a great rest of your day or evening. Thanks everyone. It's been great. Bye all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity.